Welcome to the Wednesday, February 6, 2019 meeting of the Amherst Planning Board. First item on our agenda is minutes. I don't believe we have minutes to review today. Chris? That is correct. We do not have minutes tonight. Okay, thank you. And this is our new item on our agenda, a public comment period. This is for any items which do not otherwise appear on the agenda. If any public would like to comment on such items, now is the time. All right, I see no public comments under this item. We'll move on then to item three, planning and zoning, the zoning subcommittee report. The zoning subcommittee has not met since our last planning board meeting, so we do not have an update. Is there any public comments on planning and zoning issues? And are there any other planning and zoning issues? The zoning subcommittee will next meet on February 20th before the planning board meeting on the same date. Next item is for old business, item A. This is SPR 2014-00006, Amherst College Service Building, 40 Dickinson Street, review of vehicular and pedestrian circulation plan as required by condition number six of site plan review decision. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Aaron Hayden. I work in the facilities department at Amherst College. Uh, really, I have very little to add to what you, the material you have in your packet already. Um, basically, four years ago or so, uh, this board put a couple of requirements onto our project. One of them was that we would look at it again four years hence, which is now. So um, while I haven't anything to add directly, I'm here to answer your questions if you have any about it. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from the board? Chris. I just wanted to note that I did invite Matt Cornell, who owns the property um, just to the north of this property. I let him know that this discussion would be happening tonight and invited him to come, and I don't see him in the audience. And he did not write back to me that he had questions or concerns. All right, I see no other comments. Uh, Michael? Aaron, could you walk us through the, the way that the traffic circulates around this uh, um, yes. area? Because um, it's not really clear from the map that we see. Yes, yeah, circulates is um, a bit of a broad term. Um, north of the, the building, there's a right of way, which generally we don't use. That is for the Whiting Oil folks to be able to get back to their their terminal. Um, so when I, I don't know how often that is. I've, I've actually I've never seen a truck back there. I'm not sure they're using the tank anymore, but that's that is why that way remains. On the south side of the building, that is where um, our folks come in the morning and park. And um, some of the trucks, well, most of the trucks, um, our service are start there, and so. The southern driveway, the wider one, is where the trucks come and go um, as they're going across College Street to service the campus. Uh, really, that's, that is the circulation. Uh, this is not connected to the parking lot on the corner at all, is it? There's a, um, what's not shown on the plan is a, an informal graveled path between the parking lot and the, um, the parking, uh, let me look and see what I sent. Um, oh, I'm sorry, so the, um, I sent a drawing, the one labeled January 2019, yes, exactly. Um, you can see there's a sort of a white piece that connects the two parking lots. That's an informal gravel path. Mostly that's used by the, um, the um, I, I, we call them gators. They're, they're not, they're made by all kinds of different companies, but they're the small utility vehicles, the four-wheel off-road vehicles that we use to plow our sidewalks and to carry the sand for the uh, custodians. Um, the, that's the only thing that that's used for, is road, uh, for vehicles which are not licensed to go on the road. So in order for those gators to get from 40 Dickinson Street to the campus. They're allowed to cross the road, of course, but not, not to travel on at any great distance. So that's kind of a back way for them to go. 
So I don't see any issues with the plan myself. I do have some questions. I believe, Mr. Hayden, you mentioned that it had, the condition was four years from the issuance. I, I don't remember the time exactly. Right. But so I'm, I'm, it's it, been four years, so I'm guessing that's about the amount of time. I believe so. The, the condition says three years, and number seven, condition number seven, also says three years, and that would be um, asking the applicant to submit a landscape plan to this board. And if I go by the filing date of the record of decision, it's actually been five years. So I'm just curious what might have prompted this uh, submission, and also if we did in fact receive the submission mentioned under condition seven, that in three years, if the use of the property does not change, the applicant shall submit a landscape plan to this board for review and approval. The, um, I, I don't know, um, I, I, the reason I'm here is that uh, Ms. Brestrup gave, us, gave the office a call and said, by the way, this needs to be done. And that task fell to me to do. And the only landscaping that has been done is the green space that you see here. Um, the, um, so one of, one of the things that has changed that is different now than then is that the um, Dickinson Street has been repaved. And as part of the repaving, you know, this, this landscaping was changed and made this way. And uh, the road was narrowed and the sidewalk widened and some other things like that. So this is, I'm going to, um, I'm going to offer this as our landscaping plan. The green stuff is where the landscaping is that faces the, um, the, the road itself. So that, the big green rectangle there, it's green. Great, thank you for that. Chris. Um, in your packet, you had a letter from uh, Jonathan Tucker, um, and he stated that on March 5th, 2014, the planning board did review a lighting plan and a landscape plan um, and approved those two. And reference was made to conditions eight and nine, but I'm thinking um, that this landscape plan, if, if nothing is changing, may um, satisfy the requirement of s number seven the landscape plan that was uh, approved back in 2014. That's for your consideration. So should I take that to mean that the board will not consider this new submission or revision to the landscape plan? The landscape plan was in fact previously approved and although it was noted as satisfying condition eight, you, Chris, believe it satisfied condition number seven at that time? That is for your consideration. Um, in the interim, three years have passed, and if you feel that the landscape plan that was presented back in 2014 is adequate, three years later, I would say that you could um, approve it as satisfying the condition seven. Approve the prior landscape plan, yes. That's correct. Thank you. All right, any further comments or questions from the board on this? If there are not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the vehicular and pedestrian plan as submitted. So, so moved. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burt Whistle moved and Ms. Gray Mullen seconded. Uh, motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor? And that's unanimous. Thanks so much. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. So we'll now move on to old business item 4B, topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting. No topics. New business item 5A, planning board rules and regulations, review and update to bring into compliance with Amherst Home Rule Charter and other issues, schedule public hearing. So this is an item we had discussed previously, acknowledging that in the Planning Board Rules and Regulations there are some passages which should be updated to bring them into compliance with our new charter. And we need to schedule a public hearing to do so. The Planning Board can make those amendments at public uh, hearings with a majority vote. Chris, did you have some dates in mind or any further information on this issue? I was thinking that um, you may want to discuss the rules and regs now uh, at this meeting and um, tell me about things that you might want to include in, a, uh, in the rules and regs once they're revised. Ms. Uh, Gray Mullen did submit some ideas for uh, adding things to the rules and regs. And then after um, you all come up with your ideas for adding things, I would come up with another draft 
and then perhaps at that point we would um, talk about scheduling a meeting. And I'm thinking uh, maybe late March or early April might be an appropriate time to do that. Mm -hmm. And so the document in our packets today represents a staff draft of language that should address any issues of conflict with the new charter? That's correct. That seems reasonable to me to schedule um, a hearing on this at our second meeting in March. Are there any member questions or comments now on what language we might include in the amendments? Uh, our, uh, Ms. Restrup suggested that uh, Ms. Graham Mullen had some suggestions. Uh, can we hear those or uh, how, sh how should we approach discussing them? Chris? There was a, um, an email in your packet from Ms. Gray Mullen, which I, um, I included, and she mentioned um, the possibility of including more information about um, screening, fencing of parking, um, location of dumpsters and HVAC units, and particularly ground-mounted HVAC units. Uh, she wondered if we wanted to include reference to those in our requirements for submittals for site plan review. Christine? Um, I also mentioned the design uh, review board said appointment of three years, and I was just pointing out that some of the planning board appointments aren't even that long, so maybe two years would be better. And I didn't write this down, but I just noticed this. Under meetings, it says that we will meet on the first and third Wednesday. Um, it doesn't actually say the third, like we always sort of assume the third. It says more meetings is deemed necessary, but so I didn't know if that's, I guess, another thing, whether we want to add the third week if it's there. Chris? Would that be the fifth Wednesday? Mm. Yeah, we, could, we could add that. Um, with reference to the design review board, um, that would have to be a zoning amendment. If you wanted to change the um, number of years that the design review board is appointed for, it wouldn't be in the planning board rules and regs because they really don't, um, they don't operate under the same rules and regs that the planning board operates under. Did you find something in the rules and regs that referred to the design review board's um, term? thought it was referring to just the planning board um, appointment to the, to the DRB, not anything to do with their membership, just. I think the point Chris may be making is that, so I think you're right, Christine, that that could be seen as falling under section five of the rules and regs, planning board appointments, but if I'm not mistaken, the composition and length of terms of the TRB members is also mentioned in the zoning bylaw, and so that's the change we would have to make. Christine? So the, the, our rep to the DRB is actually a member because sometimes they're not a member to some of our appointments. Some of our other appointments to other bodies, you mean? Yeah. That's, that's correct. So I guess that's what makes the difference, that you're actually a member of the DRB when you come from us. Is that what saying? So we have to apply to their rules. Um, that's somewhat the point. Um, it's not so much their rules per se as that the length of the, t of the appointments is specified in the zoning bylaw, which we can't make a change to by a simple majority vote of our own, like we can with the planning board rules and regulations. It's in the zoning for the DRB, but not all of our not planning board. So meaning other appointments we have are not, they are three years or they're not three years? Other appointments may not have their term length specified in the zoning bylaw. So do we know, looking at our liaison and committees, are there any others that are like the DRB or is the DRB the only one? like them in that their term lengths are specified in the zoning bylaw. Chris? The representative to PVPC is appointed for one year, 
um, and others are appointed to fill particular terms. For instance, if someone resigns, then you might nominate somebody to be appointed to fill the term of somebody who had resigned. So I would say it sort of varies depending on which group you're talking about. Sorry, Christine. so on the DRV, if someone, like it's Michael, right? Now let's just say Michael has only two year appointment on planning board, but he gets a three year appointment on the DRB. So if he leaves here, does he stay on the DRB? I guess that's what I'm asking. Chris. I think that has not been dealt with in writing. And it's probably something that would be dealt with once that uh, occasion arises. Michael. Um, I think the D, I may be mistaken, but my uh, assumption is that the DRB appointment from the planning board need not be a member of the planning board. It can be anyone, uh, in which case the three-year appointment to the DRB would apply whether or not someone is, continues to be on the planning board. Chris? That is correct. In the past, you have... Um nominated someone who was not a member of the planning board and that I believe that's outlined in the zoning bylaw that you may do that. So that may um, solve the riddle that Ms. Gray Mullen is bringing before us. Christine. So let's just express it here. So let's say that did happen and Michael left planning board but stayed on the DRB. Then does the planning board not have a representative for the rest of that time on the DRB, or does another member get at it, or we just don't have one? Well, I think what Chris was just saying was that our appointee need not be a member of the planning board, so that if our appointed member of the DRB should cease to be a planning board member, there's no inherent conflict there. They simply are a DRB member and not a planning board member, as I understand it. So they come back and report to us still. Is that, because that's the whole point, that we know yes. what they're doing and we're getting a report, right? As I understand it, yes. Chris. So usually when things like this come up, which we don't have a clear answer to, um, the planning department uh, consults with the town manager and um, figures out a solution and often um, consults the town attorney. Um, if, it's, if it's not really clear which direction we should go. So I would say that's probably what would happen. And then we would bring it to you for explanation or questions and concerns. Okay, other? Comments, questions, suggestions on the rules and regs? Yes, David. Can we look at the voting requirements section and just make sure that at least I understand it? Because it seems a little, and I'm tired, so I, 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 I may just be confusing myself. What section page is number? that? Oh, it's on uh, page 14. Uh, section, Sorry, section, section two? Yes, under article four on page 14. Second to last page. Page 14. Sorry, Chris. For the special, I'm just, I'm just, my, I'm spinning, my head is going in circles here, and so I just want to see if, if it makes sense. The, for the, the vote, the concurring vote of at least two-thirds of the full membership of the board shall be required for any decision on a special permit application. In the case of the seven-member planning board, two-thirds of the full membership shall be construed to be five members. So for a special permit to be approved, five of seven members must say yes. However, what if one or more members of the board are not present, are not able to vote? Then what does that mean? How many votes are needed for approval of a special permit when there are not a, when there is not a seven person? Uh, Michael, then Jack. Yeah, I think the full membership applies, and that's why five of the seven is required. So, David. regardless of how many members are at the public hearing, five is the 
is the minimum is the minimum number. Period. That, that's my understanding of the way that it's written. Yes. Uh, Jack, did you have a comment? Oh, I do. <laughs> I do. Um, what about the provision where you watch the uh, the the meeting? So the Mullen rule would allow a member who had not been present for the first public session of the public hearing to vote, but it wouldn't change, as I think David is asking, the voting requirement of five members voting in the affirmative for the passage of a special permit. Well, um, both one and two have that paragraph, only members who were in, ten in attendance at the public hearing. And is that clear enough that that, uh, I forget the name of the... The Mullen rule. Mullen, yeah. So you mean because there's no reference in these sections to that rule that was later adopted? Correct. Is, so is this still accurate, considering that we have the Mullen rule in effect? I think it could be clearer. We could insert some reference to the Mullen rule here. Uh, Chris had something to say. and So the um, MGL 39, Section 23D, is the Mullen rule? It mm -hmm. does describe I see. Um, what the voting uh, allowance is and that you can um, take advantage of that by, you know, writing out that you have reviewed the material. Thanks for that clarification. Um, David, did that answer your question on voting requirements? Perhaps, but I still don't understand then. The, set, the next paragraph. So. I, I take your point, Michael, and that makes perfect sense that no matter what, it's the full membership that is the number. And so five is an absolute number for a, a site. But then the next, sen the next paragraph, only members who are in attendance at the public hearing may vote. You know, and then if you weren't in attendance but you observe the requirements of the Mullen rule, you're, you're allowed to be, you're deemed in attendance. Okay, that's fine. But, but in a situation in which an absent member does not adhere to, or more than one absent member does not adhere to the Mullen rule exception, or five is still the number? Yes. Chris? You have to be present to vote. Does that help to explain it? You can miss one session, but you have to be present to vote. In, in other words, you can't vote by phone no, on the right. Mellon, on the, using the Mullen rule. Nah, I'm not, that's, not, that's not my confusion. I think it's just my confusion, and I'm ready to sort of live with that. <laughs> I suppose, you know, I can understand where your thought is coming from or concern. For instance, if we were to be short a member, um, full membership of the board, so say we had six members, in that case, the voting requirement would change. Or is full membership meant to mean the full potential membership? Chris? In the past, the rule was that you had to have two-thirds vote, but in no less than six. So when you had a nine-member board, two-thirds was six, and that, that was it, right? So that um, is a parallel situation to this. Two-thirds of nine is six, two-thirds of seven is five if you round up. So you have to have five members voting in the affirmative to approve a special permit. Okay. That's, Michael? That's, that's fine. David, if you finish, if you... No, no, no. I'm, I'm, go ahead. Um, I would like to suggest that uh, the requirements under B site plan review revert to the uh, original two-thirds um, instead of changing it to majority, as we, we have presented to us, uh, but retain the not fewer than four, as opposed to the not fewer than five, um, and add at the end of that three-line sentence the same two-line sentence that ends the special permit, that is to say, in the case of seven-member planning board, two-thirds of the four-member membership shall be const construed to be five members. Um, I, I think the um, requirements for uh, uh, softening the requirements for site plan review uh, as opposed to the special permit requirements uh, is inappropriate given the fact that we're now a smaller board and uh, I would prefer to see um, a two-thirds majority of 
uh, of us all when we're all here as, as five, and if fewer than uh, seven are here and voting, then um, if there are only six, that would, that would be a, a high bar to, to take if, we, if, if five were, the, were the, the minimum. So I'm willing to go with four. I, would, I think I would prefer five, but I'm willing to go with four. Uh, as long as we replace uh, two thirds, uh, we place majority with uh, two thirds and then add that uh, second sentence uh, in special permit one um, to the uh, um, sentence in, uh, into this first sentence in two site plan review. Is that clear what I'm suggesting? <laughs> I think maybe not. Um, uh, it's, it's clear, but I think one of the reasons that the number is lower is because the denominator in this case is the members of the board participating and voting as opposed to in the special permit application. It's the full membership of the board. Well, if, um, if all seven members of the board are participating, a majority means that four members of the board can decide. And I would suggest that five members of the board deciding uh, is a more appropriate number to decide on a site plan review. Christine? Can I just ask why did it get changed from two-thirds to majority? This one is confusing to me, and that's why I put the note, this section needs review by the town attorney. The way, this section needs review by the town attorneys. This section is confusing to me. So I, um, I know that in the past, we have said there has to be a two-thirds vote, and no less than five for um, a nine-member board. So if we have no less than five for a nine-member board, I was thinking, well, we should have no less than four for a seven-member board. And then I wasn't really sure what to do about the two-thirds or the majority. So the majority is offered to you as a, um, as a, a way to deal with this, but if you disagree with that, you can go back to two-thirds. So it's really up to you. This is your rules and regulations. You, you decide, but I think we do need some uh, input from the town attorney. Michael. Uh, do we still need input from the town attorney if we remain with the two thirds as the number? Chris. I'm gonna ask the town attorney to review this anyway once we come up with a draft that you all are comfortable with. So um, yes, either way, I think that we're gonna go back to the town attorney and have him look at this. So, Chris, is that to say when you're suggesting that once there's a draft that we are all okay with, you'll pass it on to the town attorney, that are you suggesting that we have another session of reviewing this prior to the public hearing being held, or are you talking about the work we do at the public hearing? Yes. I think you want a clean document before you go to a public hearing. So, um, you know, if you're going to make changes tonight, uh, that would be added to the draft, and then if once we come up with a draft that everybody is happy with, I would send that to the town attorney, and then you would bring that draft to the public hearing, because I think you don't want to be having a discussion about things that you're not really comfortable with or sure of um, in a public hearing. You want to hear from the public, but you want to be pretty clear on what, what it is you're proposing. Mm -hmm. Christine? So on the site plan review, we had it previously said two-thirds, but we always used five. It says majority. Uh, it says majority. Oh, sorry, sorry, the original one said con concurring vote of at least two thirds, but not fewer than four, uh, not fewer than five. That was the original language. That's what Which is not two thirds, I'm just no, asking. So right. there must have been an interpretation before from something else that it ended up that way, but that's why I'm at. Chris. So I'm not really sure what the origin of that was. I wasn't here when that language was put into the rules and regulations, but that's what the previous language did say. No fewer than five. Christine? I would appreciate if you could, you know, 
dig out the stories or try to find out how that came about and ask legal counsel. And if this comes from some kind of planning board um, standards. Other comments, questions on this, Jack? Are we done with that? Anything further on the uh, voting requirement? Uh, I, uh, I, I would like the planning board to, we're all here, all seven of us, uh, and to give uh, Ms. Brestrup some uh, uh, sense of what the board feels like about whether we want a majority or a two-thirds uh, plurality uh, on uh, site plan review. Uh, I'm, I'm quite adamant, not adamant, I'm not in a position to be adamant. I'm, I'm firmly convinced that a two-thirds majority is appropriate for the kind of major decision that a site plan review involves. And I think we should have that number stated, whether it is uh, moved to four or five uh, in terms of a, a, a less than a full contingent of the planning board voting. Uh, I'm less concerned about that, but I think if there are seven of us here, it should be a two-thirds majority, which is to say five, rather than a majority, which is to say four. Uh, and I would hope that we could uh, either agree that, that two-thirds is the appropriate number or majority is the, is the appropriate number and let Ms. Brestrup know about our feeling about this uh, before she consults with the town attorney. Jack? Uh, I was curious, Chris, uh, with regard to the ZBA, they are now five. And what, uh, in terms of the permits that they extend, what is the situation for the majority versus two-thirds majority? Chris. So they don't have something like site plan review. They have special permits and variances and comprehensive permits and appeals from decision of the building commissioner. Um, so most of their um, requirements are for two-thirds, um, but in the case of comprehensive permit, it is less than that. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but they don't have such a thing as site plan review. David? Um, I appreciate um, wanting to come to some sort of, or what I, what I would propose, what I would feel more comfortable with for the, is to, and I don't have them with me now, is to have a chance to look at and think for a moment about what the zoning bylaws say about site plan review and about special permits. Because it's my sense, but I want to confirm that or feel comfortable with that sense, that a site plan review has a lower, level, lower threshold for approval than a, a special permit. And that makes sense, and if that's the case, then I, I would, it makes sense to me that there are different, uh, there's a different requirement for approval. Um, and I, I could see, Greg, that you're pulling him up, but being tired and a slow thinker, <laughs> I'm not quite sure if I'm gonna be able to sort of, I, I feel more comfortable if perhaps we could having had this conversation, revisit it at the next meeting, and then come to sort of a more informed, rather than rushed, uh, 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 deliber deliberation on it. Christine. I would appreciate hearing the history of how this evolved, and or if there's an error, or I, I just, I would need more data before really determining which way I feel. Chris. The zoning bylaw does state um, that with the current, uh, with the previous makeup of the planning board, that the concurring vote of at least two thirds, but not fewer than five members of the board shall be required for any decision. So this would have to be changed if you were to change your um, rules and regs. This probably has to be changed anyway, but I'm not sure if it's one of the things that the bylaw review committee picked up on, and I should probably check that. So I will check that. Sorry, is that the site plan or the special permit section of the zoning bylaw, Chris? That's the site plan section. Um, it's section 11, and I can give you an exact um, reference. Yes. 
The section number is um, section 11.250. And we don't happen to have a copy of the amended bylaw or the changes that were in process to the bylaw based on the bylaw review committee's recommendations? I don't have that here, but I could possibly put my fingers on it. Um, it's probably better to uh, wait for the next um, meeting, though, rather than having me fumbling around in my office trying to find that. I'm sorry I didn't bring it tonight. It didn't occur to me. Okay. So I, I do agree that we should have that information ready the next time we discuss this, which would be ahead of our public hearing on the issue in late March. Would members like to revisit this issue at our very next planning board meeting? All right, so I think I'm seeing some nods. We'll put that on the agenda for the 20th. Chris? And did you want me to draft uh, something with regard to Ms. Gray Mullen's um, comments on screening HVAC and uh, the other items that she brought up in her email? Yes, please. Um, and I did have one other item I wanted to look at, which was uh, Article 5 on page 15, expedited review. Is that something, Chris, that has been used in your experience? It occurs to me over the past several years there have been a number of cases where the board felt that something didn't necessarily rise to the level of significance that it should have been brought before the board and we have addressed that in a few zoning changes over the years that give the building commissioners some more authority to make those types of decisions but I don't recall using this section of the planning board rules and regs. Chris? I would say we often don't wait the full 65 days that you're given to um, review something after it is filed. Um, the 35-day review period um, is really an opportunity to give staff an, uh, a chance to review applications. So, um, you know, we usually do try to schedule things as early as possible, and I would say that we actually probably most of the time are in the ballpark of this expedited review. We're not, um, you know, extending the time that we have for, um, for the review period. So, um, you know, sometimes you do waive the site visit requirement if you're for familiar with the property. Um, sometimes you waive some of the requirements for submission if you don't feel like they're appropriate. Um, you do render an opinion on the night of the hearing on occasion if you have enough information, and so, um, you know, I think that, in my opinion, already you are taking advantage of uh, expedited review when it's appropriate. Thank you. All right, anything else, Jack? Um, I was curious, on page three, there, there's a reduction in the number of paper copies, and uh, as our review and, and materials, is it, is there an attempt to kind of not go entirely paperless, but uh, something where we're using uh, like iPads or tablets and things like that? Is that under consideration? <laughs> Chris? So it really doesn't have anything to do with the materials that the planning board sees. It's really more of a question of what do we want to have in our office? And we used to require that um, people submit six full-size copies, and then we would send them around to the town engineer, the fire department, the building commissioner, et cetera. And um, now we're using an electronic transmittal. So um, we transmit these things to all those uh, uh, staff members via email. So they don't really need the full-size copy anymore, except for the town engineer. He often asks for a full-size copy. We like to have one in the office because it's easier to read. And you all are welcome to come in and look at it. If any of you at any point feel like you would like to have a full-size copy as opposed to an 11 by 17, which is what we usually give you in your packets, please let me know and I can request another copy or as many as you want from uh, the applicants. I know sometimes the 11 by 17s are a little hard to read, but we just felt like we didn't really want to have all that much paper floating around our office and that we would try to take advantage of electronic trans transmittal as much as possible. 
All right. Anything else on the rules and regs? Okay, so we'll revisit this at our next meeting. Moving on to the next item on our agenda, this is new business 5B, PVPC request for comments on the top 10 resolves, which we discussed at our last meeting and are included again here. Has there been any uh, movement from PVPC? Do our representatives to that group have any updates on this? Jack, Christine, no? None. No. Okay. Any comments? All right, not seeing much comment on this, so we'll move on to the next item, which is topics not reasonably anticipated under new business. None. Are there any Form A and our subdivision applications? No Form A's. Upcoming ZBA applications? We do have some of those, and I'll list them for you. I think you know that Hickory Ridge is uh, going before the ZBA. They were planning to um, go before the ZBA tomorrow night, um, February 7th. However, because of uh, some information that's still missing from their application, they've asked to have the hearing open tomorrow night and continue to March 14th. So if the ZBA uh, agrees with that, then that's what will happen. Um, then we have the Herbology Group, which is a group that is uh, proposing to sell medical marijuana and um, marijuana for recreational use at the Rafters site on Amity Street. And they, I believe, are coming before the ZBA tomorrow night. Uh, we also have um, Mass Alternative Care, which is another uh, marijuana retail and medical um, establishment, and they are um, preparing their application and will be submitting shortly. Uh, they're going into 55 University Drive um, where the, the hangar used to be. So those are the ZBA uh, applications that I know about. Thank you. Michael. Uh, clarification on the uh, Hickory Ridge uh, application. The entire uh, discussion of that was postponed until March 14th, is that correct? Chris. That's what the request has been, and I understand that the applicant is, is not proposing to make a presentation tomorrow night, but is um, hoping that the ZBA will agree to continuing the public hearing to March 14th, and I, I believe that they will um, approve that. Jack? Uh, uh, what was the outcome of the Conservation Commission, the, the second hearing with them? Chris? Um, they're going back to the Conservation Commission. There are still some outstanding items. I think, um, you know, flooding of the, of the pathways is one of them. Um, the issue of the wildlife, um, the endangered species, and the accommodations for them, and uh, some other issues. So uh, they're going back to the Conservation Commission, um, I'm going to say, in sometime in March, like perhaps March 13th, but I'm not exactly sure. I can find out that information for you. So they haven't closed the public hearing with the Conservation Commission. All right. Are there any upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Chris? Yes, there are. Um, we have one application from uh, the Wagners on Northeast Street. They would like to establish a farm stand in one of their barns and um, increase the size of the barn. Uh, they are missing some information in their application, so we've asked them to go back and, uh, and look at those things and um, submit more information. We have another application from the Emily Dickinson Museum, uh, which recently bought a property on Triangle Street right next to the Emily Dickinson Museum property, and they're proposing to turn that into offices for the Emily Dickinson Museum. Uh, we have Amherst Media, which has just submitted an application to build um, their uh, studio building, um, along with some offices on the two properties along Main Street um, that are just opposite where Elements Hot Tub, Tub Spa is, those two properties that were uh, carved out originally. Um, so they are, uh, they've submitted their application. We haven't given it a hearing date yet. And then um, Amir Mikchi had come before you last summer to present his project on Southeast Street across from the Cumberland Farms, um, and he's proposing to build um, 
a mixed-use building there with 60, I believe it's 62 or 65 apartments and um, parking and some retail space down below. Um, he's been to the Conservation Commission and been approved by them, so he's kind of refining his project and will be coming uh, to see you relatively soon. He's also proposing some work in the public way there. Uh, he's proposing a little plaza right by where the bus stop is. And um, so, you know, there's more to the project than just what's on his site. So it's kind of interesting project. And then two other things, um, scenic roads. Amir McChee is also proposing to take down some trees in front of his property. So he'll be coming to you with the scenic roads public hearing for that. And we also have a Chapter 61B withdrawal request from the people who own the Hickory Ridge Golf Club. And they're going to be coming back to our coming to request um, to have their property removed from Chapter 61B, which is uh, recreation. So I think that's, oh, then there's one more thing, a sign that's going to come to you for a new restaurant where Wings used to be by the Big Y um, uh, grocery store. Those are all things that are going to be coming before you. Do we expect any of those to be before us at our next meeting? No. Michael. Um, Chris, uh, the, uh, according to my calendar, the uh, Conservation Commission is meeting about the Hickory Ridge project on uh, the 14th, uh, I'm sorry, on the 13th of November, is, uh, of February. <laughs> Is that incorrect now? Chris. You're probably correct, Michael. I'm sorry that I said March. I think it is February. Well, if they're in fact postponing the uh, hearing for the ZBA, they may well be postponing the hearing for the CONCOM as well. I don't know. Chris. I think um, some of the material that they were missing for the ZBA is not relevant to CONCOM, but it could be. I know that some of the things are relevant to CONCOM, so I don't know if the CONCOM is um, also going to be continuing their public hearing again. I don't think so. I haven't heard that from uh, the staff person for the Conservation Commission, but if you'd like me to find that out, I will. Oh, that's okay. I'll keep track of it. All right. Thanks for those updates. Uh, next item on our agenda is nine Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports, PVPC. No update, Chris? No update. I wanted to bring up something that Mr. Um, Jemsik brought up last time, which is the healthy aging program that is being promoted by um, AARP, and I had something written down about that. Um, they're promoting something called age-friendly community designation, and several communities in Massachusetts, actually tens of communities in Massachusetts, including Northampton, are um, proposing to apply for this age-friendly community designation. And it has to do with a lot of different things like programming, um, uh, transportation, uh, handicapped accessibility, et cetera. So um, I do have a document here. If you're interested, I can um, send it to you. There are several links. I'm not sure if I sent you the links or not. But anyway, um, it's something that I'm going to be talking to the Council on Aging about on actually tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, and uh, trying to see if they wanted to partner with us, with the planning department and the planning board on um, examining whether we wanted to be an age-friendly community. My sense is that we probably do. I don't know what all the ins and outs are of the application process, but it seems like a, a, good, um, a good thing to do, a good thing to be, uh, especially given the aging of our population and the fact that we have become somewhat of a magnet for um, people who are retired they really find that Amherst is a nice place to move to after they retire. I, I appreciate that. I had forgotten, but I, I was kind of moved by that, by the presentation of the gentleman with the, the is it healthy, healthy aging? It's the Healthy Aging Collaborative and Age-Friendly Community Designation. But I hope we move forward with it. Seems like a good thing. Would that be something that the planning board need act on, or does it require being ratified by some other body in town to move forward with that designation, Chris? 
I'm not exactly sure what all the ins and outs are. I know that you have to get um, approval from the elected officials, um, but I would think that they would want to hear from the planning board about this process. So uh, hopefully the next time we meet, I'll have more information on exactly what is involved with the application process. And having spoken with the Council on Aging, I'll have a sense of whether they want to partner with the planning board on, on this effort. Is it something that you think you'd be interested in? I think we absolutely like to hear about the process and what it involves. Great, all right, thanks for that. Uh, next is Community Preservation Act Committee, which like the Ag Commission is vacant pending an appointment, I believe. Um, do we expect the council to be acting? It is the council that would act on these nominations, Chris? So I was in a meeting with um, the town manager last week, I think, and he was very interested in um, making sure that the applications, or excuse me, the appointments were made to CPAC. Um, and so I, I believe that that will go ahead because uh, the comptroller is eager to hold the CPAC meetings and, and get those recommendations underway. I have a related question for, to that. and. Um Chris, I'm not sure if you would have the answer, but it's with CPAC and our new form of government, do they plan to change their cycle, which in the past had been built around town meeting and making their recommendations at spring town meeting and receiving fundly funding a month or two after that? Do they plan to keep the same cycle that they've had in place with the new form of government? Chris? So there has been some discussion about that, about, about whether they want to keep with the, um, the springtime um, voting in of the CPAC projects. Um, I think for now, that's probably the track we're gonna be on because the town council is considering budget items this spring and they're thinking that they will consider zoning items in the fall. At least that's the general trend of things, but I think that um, the topic is still open as to whether that will carry forward into the future or whether CPAC will become more of a you know, every month uh, there will be a consideration of, of some projects. Are, so for right now, yes, they're keeping with the spring um, term, but it may change in the future. Thank you. All right, Design Review Board. Um, we have, the Design Review Board has not met since I last reported its activities to the Planning Board. Okay, uh, the same is true of the Affordable Housing Trust and the Zoning Subcommittee and UTAC. <laughs> Christine? Um, Downtown Parking Working Group has met and actually it was announced, uh, the town announced they had hired, rehired Nelson Nygaard to uh, do parking study work and they've started and last week they held some stakeholder meetings and there'll be public meetings coming and that's all for now. I did have a question on that. I believe I read in the Gazette or an online publication that specifically included in the scope of that consultant's work was assessing the need or feasibility for a new parking structure. Is that the case? Um, that would be part of their, you know, generals about how much um, it would cost and sort of like um, uh, if you're considering what you'd need to do a feasibility study, like what areas could it happen, about how much is the industry standard right now, that kind of thing. So they're trying to do an awful lot of work on, of course, a small budget, but that is part of it. Great, thanks for that. Um, report of the chair, no report. Report of staff. I don't have a report. Okay, then we'll be adjourned. Thanks everyone.